Good morning, everyone. I am Emma Jagu from EFP Energie Nouvelle in France, and I'm very pleased to host this session on air pollution. We have three uh, complementary presentations today, so hopefully we will be able to have interesting discussions as well. We will start with um, the discussion, the presentation by uh, Stekville on the evaluation of emission factors for air pollutants from biomass combustion in Lithuania. Uh, Stekville, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. So good morning, everyone. I don't know if it's good morning, at least at my country, it's morning. <laughs> so let's share my screen. Uh, can you see my presentation? Yes. Can yes, you see yeah. my presentation? Yes, yes, oh, I can I, I can hear, I think. Wow. We hear you. It's fine. Oh, it's fine. Okay, okay. So uh, so my presentation is on the health of Inga Konstantinovich Uta because she couldn't attend to um, this conference and presentation titled Evaluation of Emission Factors for Air Pollutants from Biomass Combustion in Lithuania. So, as you already know, uh, biomass burning isn't uh, a local pollution source, but also a common transboundary pollution agent. And through long-range transport, the pollutants emitted from biomass burning could, it can cause severe air pollution to other countries. And also, it should be noted that air pollution is closely linked to climate change. So despite the fact that the main driver of climate change is fossil fuel combustion, biomass burning is also a major contributor to air pollution and climate change. So increasing problems of transportary air pollution led to the signature of the Convention on Long Range Transport Air Pollution. And in compliance with this um, Convention, Lithuania each year provides a national inventory of air pollutant emissions according to the relevant source categories. And uh, after the detailed review of the national uh, inventories, uh, experts from European Commission recommended us to use the country-specific emission factors for estimation of air pollutant emissions in the energy sector. So, in order to ensure the reliability and accuracy of data, it was necessary to assess national emission factors according to the fuel type and technology in our energy and residential combustion sectors. So, the study is focused on uh, biomass combustion as biomass, comb uh, biomass fuel are uh, widely used in all Lithuanian energy sectors, especially in residential uh, sector, and uh, that's why it releases a large, pa uh, large part of pollutants into the atmosphere. And one important part of uh, scientific work was to provide uh, relevant data on country and technology specific national emission factors and to improve quality and transparency of uh, our inventory. 
So it's seen from figures that biomass dominates in the structure of fuel consumption uh, and it's uh, everywhere increasing. So in in, in 2090s, it's accounted for almost 40 persons. Sorry to interrupt. I see you're sharing your entire screen message right on the title. I don't know if it's the same for the others. If you could try to move it up a little bit so we can see the title of the slides. Oh. Is it better? Um, now it's okay? Not yet. If you can try to click on the message, you are sharing your entire screen and shift it a bit higher. Uh -huh. okay. Yes, perfect. Thanks. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, so, residential heating is critical energy service needed worldwide. And in Lithuania, there are no direct government incentives for residential heating with biomass, but historically, biomass always uh, dominates uh, in the structure of fuel consumed in the residential sector due to comparatively low prices in comparison, for example, with the natural gas fuel. Uh, if we take a look at consumption in heat-only boilers, uh, we will see that uh, biomass, burn, uh, bio, biomass also continues to be mostly practiced in Lithuania. So, uh, biomass uh, heating fuels consist primarily of wood and can also include uh, wood waste and agriculture residuals. Uh, so, most fuel are burned in low capacity boilers, I mean in the residential sector, and also open fire places are also popular in many households. And in general, uh, the highest share of biomass for heating is burned in stoves with incompletely uh, combusted fuel due to low combustion temperature and other technological limitations resulting in high emissions of many products from incomplete combustion such as um, nitrogen or sulfur, volatile organic compounds and particulate matter. So the level of emissions was uh, evaluated in our study as well. So, for measurement aim, the technologies were grouped in three categories by power. It's up to 50 kilowatts, from 50 to 1 megawatt, and from 1 megawatt to 50. Emissions were measured from 26 different biomass technologies. And it, um, in our residential sector, emissions were measured in also in different types of biomass heating equipment, that automatic stoves, manual stoves, and fireplaces. So the concentrations of most um, Air pollutants were measured by uh, such equipment, portable gas analyzer, product analyzers, absorption tubes, gas chromatograph, and automatic particulate matter collectors. So the um, also, uh, differentiation of measurements were done according to the type of fuel and power, and it should be noted that all measurements were made at the maximum capacity of the units. Uh, so the methodology of, for calculating the emission factors uh, through actual measurement uh, consisted of four steps. The first step is concentration was uh, evaluated and conducted uh, unit conversion uh, was done to, co to make conversation from one dimension to another. And second one 
was uh, standardizing the heating uh, value and fuel consumption. Third step is estimation of emissions over a given period of time. And the last step was um, a calculation of uh, emission factors. Uh, um, only for C C CO emissions was estimated based on amount of fuel combusted and the average carbon content of fuel. Of fuel. So, however, emissions of other air pollutants uh, uh, was influenced by different um, uh, additional factors such combustion technology, operating conditions, temperature, and much, much other. So in this picture, you can see emission factors disaggregated by capacity for aerosol particles, 2.5. As you can see, mm -hmm. uh, so red line means the default emission factor provided by EMAP Emission Inventoring Guidebook. So you can see that all our emission factors was much, much lower than default emission factor. Also, it was estimated by technology for automatic, manual, and fireplaces technology, and it was the same results. Uh, all emission factors was much lower. That means that by using default emission factors provided by the guidebook, we have over estimation of emissions in Lithuania, which provided to Europe Commission. And so uh, uh, you can see the table comparison of determined emission factors with uh, default emission factors in red. So our emissions uh, in green, so it, it, it's, as you already told, much, much lower emissions. And it should be noted that evaluation of country-specific emission factors were based on median, which better than average, and it revealed position of the data on the row containing the exclusions. So in the next um, figure, you can see national emission factors for nitrogen oxides as well for um, for um, stoves with capacity from 1 to 50 megawatts, the emission factors was also uh, much, much lower. But if we go for technology uh, up to 50 kilowatts, we can see that in some cases for automatic stoves, emission factors uh, was uh, higher than average default emission factors. And in this table, you can see that for automatic stoves, emission, national emission factor was a little bit higher than default emission factor. So we choose uh, for our inventorying uh, national emission factors, uh, despite the, the fact that it's higher. And for boilers, uh, with low capacity uh, provided default emission factors was much, much higher than we have measured. So in this part, we have really um, uh, our estimations as boilers in such low capacity dominate in Lithuania. Uh, in next figure, you can see national emission factors uh, for CO for biomass combustion technologies and only for, uh, for, for boilers with capacity from 1 to 50 megawatts, the emission factors was deep differ and in average it was uh, higher than default emission factors and of course if we go to the lower capacities we again have uh, larger uh, national emission factors in some cases uh, in comparison with the default emission factors in manual and uh, in automatic boilers. So this table shows the values and you can see that for manual stoves uh, uh, 
we have uh, evaluated higher emission factor. And for volatile organic compounds, we uh, again have higher national emissions uh, factors and um, also much higher for manual uh, stoves. If we go to the uh, detailed values, we can see that median was lower in comparison with average values, but as I already told, median values is much, much better represent our measurements. And for CO emission factors, default emission factors was higher, and we again have um, underestimations, but this underestimation is scientifically based, and in all cases, we have better uh, uh, national emission factors, which represent real situation in Lithuania. And going to the conclusions, our obtained research results, um, of course, reduce uncensitivity of air pollution emissions in our um, inventory system. And uh, what we conclude that all pollution emissions highly depend on fuel type, on the boiler operating mode, and uh, optimization of combustion processes needed every year. And uh, the for evaluation of country-specific emission factors for pollution and show more accurate accounting of national emissions. So performed analysis showed that boilers have extremely low aerosol particle 2.5 emissions when complete biomass combustion is ensured and biomass boilers uh, with larger capacity with install condensing economizers behind multi-cyclones and show very high suspended particles. It's um, PM2.5 emission reduction efficiency uh, up to 99 persons. And the last one conclusion that measurement showed that modern residential biomass boilers has low PM2.5 emissions and in particular boilers with flexible control of fuel air supply. So thank you for your attention. Thank you uh, very much, Stekvile. It was uh very clear presentation and it seems like a very relevant policy relevant uh, contribution um are there any questions in the room if yes you can uh, just unmute and ask your question directly or write it in the chat Um, so maybe I can start with a few questions I have. Um, the first one is a clarification question. Um, where, do, where do the average default factors come from? Uh, are there uh, worldwide factors that are identified or? Okay, for Europe emission inventoring, of course, uh, for countries not only uh, covered by uh, convention of long range transport was provided um, European IMAP uh, uh, um, emission accounting guidebook where you can find all emission default emission factors in case if you have no country specific but of course country specific national emission factors are uh, always better represent the real situation in country because you know it's it's different uh, mentalities, different his, his, his history, and different technologies. <laughs> mm -hmm. And how do you explain that um, in Lithuania almost all emissions factor are lower except a few ones? Is it because the technology is more efficient? Uh, I think that that provided emission factors in national in the guidebook uh, a little bit old fashioned, and of course they represent, um, uh, let's say, 
uh, higher values just to ensure that we not underestimating our emissions. So it's better to show a little bit higher values for other countries, but in case you have your national, you, you are welcome to always to use them. Okay. Um, don't hesitate to raise your hand if you have uh, questions. Uh, I have another one. Um, I'm, I'm wondering uh, wh where does the data come from? Because I guess it's backed uh, from the industry. Is it like a national uh, regulation or inventory that has been done previously? Do you mean in default emission factors? No, on the national uh, emission factor. Oh, okay, on the national, okay, that that was only stuffs from residential heating. I mean, uh, just households in individual households. So we have uh, uh, not we, but my colleague Inga, which uh, should present <laughs> today results uh, in her institute. They have laboratories, uh, and its main main. Um, a scientific field of research, Lithuanian Energy Institute. So they have simulations for different types of uh, residential heating stoves. And of course, we did our experiment, experiments in real um, households. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that were my questions. Um, and the, the few peaks that you had, like the few values that were much higher than the average values, uh, do you have an interpretation for that as well? Uh, okay, so I think um, that was, um, um, I, don't, I don't know how to say, probably Inga would, would <laughs> represent better your thoughts, but I think that was uh, a, a, a little statistics. We need more statistics. So for 10, for example, experiments on that was only a few ones. I would say it's statistics. And probably stuffs wasn't uh, operated at the best optimization. Okay. All right. Um, maybe a final question. Um, so this data that you have uh, uh, gathered, uh, calculated, simulated, you're going to uh, submit, give it to the European uh, to the authorities, right? For them to use. Will it also be open data for other researchers to use? Yes, of course, uh, we, 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 we would like if countries uh, with the same history could use emission factors, for example, Latvia or Estonia, I think it's the, the, the same emission factors and even in Poland they could use, because it's the same technology provided for households. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very much. Very interesting and re policy relevant research. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, uh, hearing your presentation. Now Thank we're you. going to move to the next presentation by Chuan Wan. Uh, how do the economic activities influence the air quality in China? The floor is yours. You're still mute. Uh, um, yeah, yeah, okay. I just found that. Okay, can everybody see my screen? Yes, we see it perfectly. Okay, okay, thank you. So um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, I'm Yang Chuan Wang and uh, I'm gonna, t I'm from um, I'm from Department of Agriculture Applied Economics at Virginia Tech. Uh, I'm currently in Virginia, US, so uh, it's uh, like a very early morning or evening here. And uh, I'm gonna present how do economic 
activities influence the air quality in China. And my co-author is Zheng Yao, who is also in my department. And I'll start with Andy. So, so I'm gonna first introduce my topic. I'll start with the um, basic idea of air pollution. So air pollution is one of the highest uh, environment environmental uh, health challenges such as uh, mental illness, uh, depressive symptoms, heart problems, and higher mortality. And China is one of the largest developing country and experiencing the severe air pollution. Um, the question for us and um, for a lot of previous uh, literature is that how to measure the impact of um, economic activity on air pollution in China so uh, many studies has applied the um, nightlights as a proxy of economic activity. And uh, most of the research was done by Chen and the Nodos, and they read several papers uh, about the proxy of the um, economic activities and also Henderson et al. Um, uh, write some papers uh, in this field. And the issue is that a uh, few studies focus on investigating the small scale administrative regions such as community level regions. So um, this give us a chance to fill in this gap. Uh, we, in our study, we want to uh, study the uh, community level regions and and the uh, light and the activities and the pollution in those community level regions. So we investigate the impact of the activity based on the monthly night lights on air pollution at the community level administration, administration um, regions in China. So our before we talk about our model, we first, we will uh, talk about the proxy that was used in our study. We will use the uh, night light, nighttime lights as the proxy of the uh, nighttime economic activity. And while many industry plants don't um, emit lights at night, nighttime economic activity in service sectors are normally observable and hence can be captured by their light emission. Um, so uh, based on this fact, we assume that all the nighttime economic activities is, can be captured by nighttime lights. And based on this assumption, uh, we build up this uh, estimation model. So uh, this is our baseline model. Our baseline model will estimate the effect of nighttime light uh, NL on the nighttime AQI, which is uh, air quality indicators at community I in CTK um, in month T. And the model is specified as this um, equation one, as you can see here. And we also have X here. Uh, X uh, represents the meteor meteorological covariance such as air temperature and precipitation. And we also have F here that will represent um, multiple fixed effects um, such as uh, city level fixed effect or um, year and month fixed effect. And we also will have interaction of these um, fixed effect. So that will all count in the um, F here. And we also have uh, alpha, that will be our uh, basic fixed effect of community I. So um, this is our equation one and this is our baseline model. And the, there are some problem of this equation one is that the equation one can bring a potential endogenous problem um, if people stay indoors caused by heavy air pollution outside. So uh, that means um, in that case, uh, like if it's under the heavy air pollution, the dependent variables is uh, likely to 
affects the independent variable, which is a light here. So that's is something that we don't want to see here. And we also use some reference to uh, prove that this uh, endogenous problem can happen. So uh, we found there is a literature um, written by Savo published in uh, published in 2020, and he mentioned that uh, local pollution was a determinant of the electricity demand under poor air quality. And um, the issue is that the naked eye can detect the differences in PM 2.5 concentration below um, 10, uh, 10 UG um, per cubic meter versus uh, above 50 or 100 uh, UG per cubic meter. So the issue is that um, if the air quality gets worse, for example, like the AQI is larger than 100 or the PM 2.5 is larger than 75, then people can detect the bad air quality and they hence decide, decide to uh, stay at home. So, so that they will um, uh, have lights where they can, uh, the household will emit the, the nighttime lights, then uh, the relationship that we build on equation one will be not uh, exist anymore. And if, if that will happen, then the dependent variables can affect the independent variables. So um, then we think that the under, only under a certain level, the pollution uh, will not affect the indoor activities and hence will not uh, affect the nighttime light. So based on this analysis, we uh, also look at the uh, some of the important literature that regarding the uh, different levels of air quality. We found from the uh, least paper published in Jim in 2019, that uh, he mentioned, they mentioned there's uh, different types of the air quality, um, some of the good, moderate, and based on the Salvos paper that um, probably uh, if the AQI is lower than 100, then the uh, air quality can be good enough so that people cannot detect the differences between the uh, good, good air quality or the bad air quality so that people uh, will don't care whether uh, they were influenced by the heavy pollution. So uh, based on this uh, table and the uh, analysis we had uh, in the previous slides, we have our modified estimation equation. So in this um, uh, equation, we also uh, consider to eliminate the effects of the accumulated daytime pollution, as I mentioned here. Um, the, the issue is that uh, we have the same independent variables uh, as we have in uh, equation one. So the equation two and the equation one will have the exactly the same independent variable, but differences is the dependent variables. So the different dependent variables here is the uh, AQIF, which is the difference of nighttime AQI uh, and the daytime AQI. So the way we we did this is that, uh, as I mentioned, we want to eliminate the effect of the accumulated daytime pollution. So um, we will also only estimate the equation two under the good and or moderate air condition. As I mentioned, there are probably some indulgent problem if the air condition is uh, worse than um, than a hundred of the air uh, AQI here. So in the following estimation, uh, what we will do is we have a one baseline equation estimation and the rest of the estimation will, will um, based on the equation two. And the equation two, uh, again, as I mentioned, is only estimate when the AQI is in good or moderate air condition. So I hope this is clear here. And now I'm gonna talk about the data part. So our night light, nighttime light is collect, uh, collect from the uh, VR 
BIIRS uh, data set, which is a global visual, visible infra, infrared imaging uh, radiometer suit and uh, it's uh, nighttime light data. And we have air pollution data, uh, which is uh, collect from the Ministry of Ecology and Environment of um, People's Republic of China. And we, since we focus on the air pollution and the night, night light on the community level, uh, we build a five kilometer buffer with the location of the community. Uh, about the meaning uh, about the meaning of uh, this location and the buffer I will talk about uh, uh, in the uh, in the next slides and uh, in the data set we also have um, AQI um, PM 2.5 PM 10 um, CO and O2 and CO2 SO2 and the, the data is a monthly data because uh, the nightlight data is a monthly data so we have to arrange all the air pollution data into a, a monthly data. And the data is, uh, uh, our data set is from January 2015 to December 2019. So uh, in this image, in this figure, I show an example of the um, province of the nighttime, nighttime lights in one province in, in China. So uh, as you can see, we collect not all the areas of this province, the area of the Can uh, Guangdong province is much like, um, as you can see, it's uh, pretty large here. But what we will observe from the this Guangdong province, the only the red, in, in only the green circle here. So the larger circle, it is the, um, brighter the night light will be. So um, this just give an example of how the data of the um, light will look like. But actually, we collect the uh, data from the whole China. So um, uh, that this will just be a part of the whole sample size. And we also have descriptive statistics and uh, for the nighttime pollution and the uh, meteorological variables and the light. So uh, we have more than uh, 83,000 observation here. And, uh, and I, I also show the AQI, nighttime AQI here. So um, as we mentioned, we will um, consider the good or moderate um, air quality so uh, among all the observations of the uh, nighttime air quality, uh, a, a nighttime AQI, we have uh, the red, red um, vertical line and the green vertical line to indicate how much the observation that's um, in the good or moderate air, air quality. So as you can see, most of the observation of AQI, for example, uh, are either good quality or moderate quality. Uh, like if you can see the right hand, uh, the the left hand side of the uh, red, red red curve or the uh, green line here, uh, just uh, what we will estimate in the following few steps, and also the PM two point five. Uh, most of the uh, quality most of the observation are in the good air quality or moderate air quality. Uh, the, and that's the same story as a PM10 or CO or NO2, SO2. Um, most of the observation are in the moderate or good quality. So that's what we want and we won't lose too much observation in our estimation. So, then we um, consider the um, difference of the nighttime quality, uh, nighttime AQI and uh, daytime AQI. Because uh, remember in um, equation two, the dependent variable is the nighttime difference AQI. So I here I show the uh, difference, nighttime difference um, AQI here. So uh, as you can see, most of the observation are 
um, close to zero, um, no matter AQI or PM 2.5 is um, mostly around zero. So that means um, the difference of nighttime air quality and daytime air quality are pretty similar um, across the year. But the uh, exception is the NO2 here. As you can see, the uh, median or the mean of the NO2 is uh, like um, much higher than zero. So uh, that means the uh, nighttime um, NO2 is much higher than uh, daytime NO2 uh, for a lot of days, a lot of months. So I'm going to show the uh, results here. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, in our estimation, in all our estimation, we have only one baseline estimation and the rest of them are the um, estimation based on equation two. So here in table two, we show the baseline estimation. The dependent variables here is the uh, nighttime air quality indicator. So the dependent variables is uh, just nighttime AQI or nighttime um, 2.5, PM 2.5 or nighttime uh, PM 10. Uh, the dependent variable is not different. So uh, the results show that uh, the, we have the positive effects of nighttime lights on the uh, nighttime uh, air quality indicators such as AQI or PM 2.5 or PM 10. And there, uh, given we have two sets of uh, fixed effects in the, in some of the um, set of fixed effects, the, if the effect of nighttime light is significantly um, positive, but for the rest of them, um, they are positive, but not significant. So, uh, Combine these two set of fixed effects. Uh, we just show okay how the um, baseline estimation will be, and it seems that um, a lot of things are in our expectation. So, uh, in table three, we show that the estimation based on equation two. So, in equation two, the dependent variables is the uh, nighttime air quality, but now it's uh, um, air quality is in at good or moderate level, and we see a very similar patterns here. Um, the nighttime light has positive effects on the uh, air quality uh, AQI, PM 2.5 and PM 10. So um, this, the, the estimation are pretty consistent here. And um, I want to talk too much about the combination of the uh, fixed effect, but we, when we put the, all the variables in the estimation, we um, consider like always consider two sets of the fixed effect combinations here. And um, here these uh, nightly uh, difference air quality indicators are the dependent variables. And again, we set the constraint that um, we only estimate the uh, equation two when the air quality is at good or moderate level. And uh, if you can see the results that like um, column two and column four, the effect of the nighttime light has positive effects on the um, nightly difference air quality indicators. So um, uh, here I'm gonna sh show the uh, interpretation. So uh, if the nighttime lights increase, then uh, we will have more uh, pollution at night. So this will be given by the uh, indicators of AQI and PM 2.5, but the evidence is not significant from uh, PM 10. So um, the next things that we want to explore is the heterogeneity issues. So uh, we consider several heterogeneous um, effects. Uh, we also consider, um, we first consider the other, the other um, pollutants such as uh, SO2 or CO. And um, we also uh, will um, take the seasonal variations into account. We will uh, do different estimation. 
And we also um, consider the spatial effects. And for that part, we are still um, uh, building our models. So uh, we will show them maybe um, late this month, but unfortunately in this conference, um, we don't have much time to deal with that. And we also will deal with the heavy pollution situation. As I mentioned that in the heavy pollution um, condition, then the estimates that we have built earlier is not, um, will, will not exist. The irradiation will be problematic since there's a uh, uh, indulgent problem. So we hope to solve this problem as soon as possible. Um, so this is still in progress. And first we will uh, deal with the different um, pollutants as I showed here. We, here we have dependent variables of CO and O2 and SO2 here. And um, the independent variables are exactly the same as I showed earlier. Uh, we have a uh, night light time. Uh, we have different uh, uh, covariates such as air temperature, precipitation, um, and we also have different combination of the fixed effect, which is the same as we showed earlier. So uh, the story is pretty similar that although the ACO uh, has no effect received from the nighttime lights, we can see from NO2 and SO2, um, the nighttime lights will have positive effects on um, nighttime NO2 and will also have positive effects on SO2. So uh, in that, uh, in terms of the uh, significant level and the, uh, the sign, um, these estimates are pretty consistent with what we have shown earlier. So um, in this part, I will show the uh, seasonal heterogeneity analysis here. So we divide the, uh, the one year into two, four parts, um, January to March, uh, April to June, July to September, October to December. And uh, we uh, separate the sample size like also in four parts and we did the estimation. The results show that in spring, uh, from April to June, the effects are not significant. And in fall, it's also not significant. But the interesting sh issue is that um, in summer and in uh, winter, the, uh, the signs are positive and significant. And if we, combine, if we compare the uh, effects in summer and winter, we find that in winter, the magnitude um, of nighttime light uh, it is larger than the magnitude in summer. So as you can see the 0 0.03, um, 0 0.08 or 0 0.03 are larger than uh, 0 0.02 here. So uh, we can imagine that if we have more uh, nighttime light uh, in winter, uh, and the pollution will be much uh, heavier in that season compared to uh, summertime. So that's pretty much I want to talk about today. And uh, our conclusion is pretty um, simple. So um, in this research, we first apply the nighttime light as a measurement of um, economic activities. And we investigate the effect of nighttime lights on the air pollution um, in developing country using um, China as our sample. And uh, we find that under the good or moderate air quality, I should mention here is a good or mo moderate air quality, the effect is significantly positive and uh, our study will also contribute to the literature on empirically estimating the satellite's image um, nightlight on air pollution with a wider range of spatial and temporal variation. 
So um, that's all I want to talk about today. So thank you very much. And if you have some question, I will be pretty happy to. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Yingshan, uh, for your interesting presentation uh, with a lot of uh, re interesting results, uh, very detailed. If there are uh, any questions, don't hesitate to raise your hands. Otherwise, I have a few. Um, I have a few clarification questions first. Oh, and by the way, um, thank you for joining us so late at night. You must be a bit tiring. Well, I get used to that, so uh, okay. <laughs> it doesn't matter, yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, I have a few clarification questions on why you chose to uh, look at communities and not cities or smaller geographical scale. What is the advantage of looking at that? So, um... The issue that the if we consider the community, then we will probably have more observation. Then the estimates will be more precise than the estimation in city size, because um, a city will probably in China in the city will probably have a um, a lot of community, maybe seven or maybe eight, and uh, we will. Uh, as I showed in the earliest, early slides. Um, oops. We have a uh, different community and uh, the lights will uh, vary by the community, even they are in the uh, same city. So in that case, the estimates will be more precise. And, uh, and we also uh, have different like fixed effects and that mm -hmm. will consider the community level. Um, so in that sense, we won't ignore any effects from the community. Yeah. And how did you define communities? Uh, so I, so that's the definition made by the uh, traditional, like it's a quite official, uh, concept, I would say, because it's uh, defined by the Chinese government. So, like there is a oh, certain, okay. yeah, it's a, as a, an administrative um, community. So that's uh, pretty official. And we just cited from, we just, uh, first we look at the uh, website and they, uh, the, the website mm -hmm. showed all the community, official community, they have names, location, um, city, even the city. So we just download them. From the uh, from the website, yeah. So it's pretty straightforward. We don't have to define the um, community by ourselves, yeah. Okay. And um, so it's if I understand it correctly, it's mainly mm -hmm. resident residential areas, or are there also industries in these communities uh, that yeah, could so, impact? So uh, thank you for your question. That's the uh, potential issue that we will probably uh, talk about. Uh, and um, yeah, so the community here, uh, usually they are in the uh, residential area, but there is also some possibility that there is uh, some industrial uh, location, industrial um, properties in that area. It's also possible because what we will look at is the, is the, is the station um, in that community because we want to get observation of the, we're going to get the data and the data is from this, uh, the station, the uh, pollution station. And um, it just depends on where the pollution station looks at. If it, it looks at some industry location, then the pollution is, um, as you mentioned, it's uh, maybe it's uh, like an industrial pollution. But if it's in the residential area, then it's probably represent the pollution in the residential area. So uh, we don't distinguish uh, whether it's in um, industrial area or residential area. We just talk about all of them. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, I have, uh, then I've, two other questions, but uh -huh. don't hesitate if there are any 
other question in, in the, uh, among the participants. The first one is, I find it very interesting that you broke your results down per uh, pollutant. Uh -huh. Do you have an interpretation on why NO2 and SO2 were the most significant in uh, all the uh, possible pollutants that you took into account? Is it linked to maybe AC or, or heating systems? Okay, thank you for that question. So uh, in that sense, we uh, is... Wait a second. So is that what you want to yeah, uh, discuss? Right. So uh, your question is that why the NO2 or CO is uh, like uh, different from the others? Mm -hmm. So uh, that's a good question. We haven't thought about this yet. And um, from my um, from my experience of the um, from the literature, um, it's also possible that there is a they came from the AC or something else. Um, but here, what we want to uh, capture is that we want to try to uh, use different kind of pollutants to measure whether the pollution uh, to measure the effects of the nighttime lights on the um, air pollution. Uh, and yes, the if we talk about um, the CO or NO2, is there any um, differences of these two or with others? We probably look at the um, origins of all kinds of pollutants. And um, I think we will talk, we will, um, my author and I will talk about this later on. And um, now I don't have a very specific uh, answer for that part, but thank you for your question, yeah. Okay, thanks. And then my last question would be, um, if I understood correctly, you have not looked at uh, the heavy pollution uh -huh. yet. Um, why is it challenge, more challenging than to look at good or moderate pollutions? Um, so um, uh, as I mentioned in the model parts. So um, as um, we use a literature that's uh, written by Savo, and he mentioned that uh, under the good or air pollution, he didn't mention the good or moderate air pollution, he just mentioned that under certain level, the PM 2.5 concentration can be filled or can be detected by uh, naked eye. So okay. um, in that sense, we think that, um, uh, oh, 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 yeah, after we look at this, we compare the level that he mentioned in his paper. Uh, we compare that level to the official like um, um, transition table, I would say, because uh, in this table that's, uh, I'm not sure whether it's only China, China um, administration's work, or the other uh, administration's work, they just combine the uh, different types of pollution into a certain level of AQI. So they, they give their names and they have um, levels so that, uh, for example, if the AQI is moderate, then the pollutants like will have a number. So given this true information, I mean mm -hmm. the table and also the information given by Savo, we consider that um, people will change their behavior if they're facing the um, bad, bad pollution, they will uh, stay at home, um, not go outside. So uh, that's our assumption of uh, people's behavior. So um, if it's under the good or moderate, um, moderate air condition, then people just um, don't feel about it, don't feel about the badness of the air quality so that they can do whatever they want. So um, the, they will stay at home. And our logical is that they will stay mm -hmm. at home and then they have night light and the night light will represent the um, economic activities. And we want to check whether mm -hmm. it will affect the um, pollution. but. 
if the assumption of the um, I mean, the if they if people can feel the bad pollution, they might be like go another way. Um, they mm -hmm. feel the bad a bad um pollution. They would rather stay at home than they have night di nighttime light. Then the uh the uh effects will be like the other way wrong. The dependent mm -hmm. variables, the pollution will affect the nighttime light. So. Uh, that will bring some endogenous effects. Yeah. True. All right. And do you already have some uh, ideas on how you're going to uh, analyze this data? If yeah. You're so to... um, uh, we have two proposals. The first one is to use like a um, city level, uh, which has like potentially um, GDP data and but it has uh, less uh, observation because it not, not only has less um, like community, it also have less time period because it mm -hmm. will only have um, annual observation. Uh, here we have a monthly observation. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's one choice that we can do. And the second choice is to use instrument uh, of the heavy pollution. So uh, we haven't tried yet, but it can be a solution for us. Uh, and the model is will be different from what I want to show here. So, um, and I think we will have more discussion about that because that's uh, now for us, it's just uh, like two potential choice, whether they can work is another story. But yeah, thank you for your question about that. All right, thanks a lot for your Thank presentation. You. Um, so now we can move on to the last presentation today, presented by Xiao Jie Liao. Li Liao, sorry for mispronouncing. Um, and the title is Urbanization and its Contribution on Haze Pollution Exposure a Decomposition Analysis for China's City Clusters. The floor is yours. Okay, can you hear? Can you see my screen? Yes, perfectly. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Liao Xiaojie, an MPhil student from Huazhong University of Science and Technology. It's my great honor to share our working paper here. This paper was co-authored with my supervisor, Professor Wang. We try to explore the role of regional collaborations within China's urban agglomerations in haze pollution abatement. We applied the method of spatial temporal decomposition to find out how much do urbanization and haze pollution control policy contribute to, to the haze pollution in the nine urban agglomerations of China. And, and we highlight the importance of regional collaborations by comparing the results between central cities and peripheral cities. In recent years, China has made remarkable achievements fighting against urban haze pollution since 2013. This photo shows the gray sky in Beijing and we can hardly see the tower behind the building. Later, in September 2013, the State Council of China issued the Air Pollution Prevention and Control Action Plan starting to combat haze pollution. In the following five years, the, the PM2.5 concentrations uh, significantly dropped by 39% uh, nationwide and 57% in Beijing. And this picture shows the blue sky in Beijing's Palace Museum in 2020. We can see a great improvement of the air quality in Beijing. So what exactly contribute to this favorable change? As we know, has pollution is closely connected to urbanization process. It's mainly from human activities, uh, production emissions, construction sites, and transportation. And it's related to population agglomeration, economic growth, and city expansion, which reflect the 
process of population urbanization and economy urbanization and land urbanization, respectively. In addition, the, spati the spatial spillover effects will also cause regional haze pollution. And we notice that the 11th five-year plan of China proposed to take urban agglomerations as the primary form of urban urbanization process. But given the compact distri distribution of cities and close economic ties among cities in urban agglomerations, it will be easier to form regional health pollution. So in order to combat regional health pollution, the APCAP policy that I mentioned in the beginning introduced the regional cooperation mechanism. This mechanism requires governments to set an, set, set an overall regional reduction target, carry out unified standard and supervision, provide economic assistance and share environmental information. In this way, some central cities such as Beijing and Tianjin have provided some special funds for their peripheral cities to control health pollution. This mechanism is important in urban agglomerations since regional transmission accounts for 20% to 40% of the health pollution in central cities. So controlling regional health pollution needs joint efforts of central cities and peripheral cities. We then raise, raise three questions and try to answer it. The first is, does the APCAP policy alleviate the health pollution coming along with urbanization and promote the effects of health pollution abatement action? The second is, are there any differences in policy effects between central and peripheral cities? The third is, does the regional cooperation mechanism coordinate the haze pollution abatement within urban agglomerations? And this map shows the locations of the nine urban agglomerations. The top three national urban agglomerations are Yangtze River Delta, Beijing Tianjin, Be uh, Yangtze River Delta, and Beijing Tianjin Hebei, and Pearl River Delta. They located in the coastal area and with large population and developed economy. The next two national urban agglomerations are middle reaches of Yangtze River and Chengdu Chongqing, located in the central and western China. They are less developed than the top three urban agglomerations, but they grew rapidly these years and called as new engines of China, China's economy. The last four urban agglomerations are regional. They are, uh, they are Central Plains, Guangzhou Plain, Beibu Gulf, and Har Harbin Changchun with smaller population or lower per capita GDP. Now, let me show you how the has pollution changed in the nine urban agglomerations and their central and peripheral cities from 2005 to 2018. We used has exposure to measure has pollution, which is one of the main indicator of air quality used by the World Bank. It can be calculated by the PM2.5 concentration weighted by the proportion of the city's population to the total population. We can see that in every urban agglomeration, no matter in the average level or central cities or peripheral cities, has exposure increased in the early several years and then dropped significantly. They most peak in around 2013. Um, the average has exposure of the nine urban agglomerations increased by 17% from 2005 to 2013 and then dropped by 35% uh, in the following five years. Besides, has exposure in central cities were always higher and grew faster than peripheral cities. But after 2013, they both dropped significantly. The average level, the average level of has exposure in central cities were always higher, uh, uh, increased by uh, 26% before 2013. 
while it only increased by 11% in central cities. However, after 2013, they both decreased around uh, 35%. Now we know urbanization and has pollution control may result in this change, but how much do they contribute? So next, we use the decomposition approach to answer it. Now let me introduce the sample and method we used. We took the top nine urban agglomerations in China as our sample, including 15 central cities and 132 peripheral cities ranging from 2005 to 2018. We applied the, the decomposition method of spatial temporal LMDI developed by Angletel. This method facilitates us to conduct flexible decomposition and comparison by creating a base city using the average value of the whole sample, which provide the same benchmark for all real cities to compare. In this equation, P bar I denotes the has exposure of city I, and it can be expressed as the product of five contributing factors related to urbanization and has pollution control. The first two factors reflect the population urbanization process. They are population agglomeration. They are population agglomeration and PA and population density, PD. The former is the proportion of the city's population to the total population of the sample. It reflects the relative agglomeration and polarization level of urban population. And the latter is the population per unit area of the city. It shows how crowded the city is. The third factor is emission growth denoted as E I uh, denoted as PY, measured by the per capita GDP. It reflects the economic urbanization process. The fourth factor is emission uh, is city expansion, denoted as CE, measured by the city's build-up area. It reflects the land urbanization process. The final factor is emission intensity of has, has pollution, denoted as EI. It measures the emission of PM2.5 per unit of GDP, and a lower level of emission intensity may reflect a tougher has pollution control policy in this city. The contributions of each factor of cities can be simply summed up to get the results of every urban agglomeration. Then we analyze the results in three dimensions, before and after the policy, inter-urban agglomerations and within urban agglomerations. We focused on the comparison within urban agglomerations because by comparing the results between central cities and peripheral cities, we would understand the effects of regional cooperation mechanism. Now, let me, let's move on to the result part. In this bar plot, each colorful bar measures the contributions of the corresponding factor to the annual change of has exposure in the nine urban agglomerations. The first noticeable factor is emission intensity, showed in grass green. Um, the contributions of emission intensity were positive in some urban agglomerations and but negative in the rest. And, and instead, population density showed in green orange were always the leading negative contributor. However, after 2013, emission intensity became the primary negative contributor in eight of the nine urban agglomerations. It means that the has pollution control policy was carried out well and helped a lot to reduce has exposure. Second, the contributions of population agglomerations built in dark green are the smallest but noteworthy. Before 2013, they were only positive in the top three urban agglomerations and negative in the rest. But after 2013, they became negative in the in Yangtze River Delta and Beijing Tianjin Hebei, while positive in some other urban agglomerations. It means that the population urbanization has been cleaner in the top two 
urban agglomerations, while in some other urban agglomerations, population inflow was likely to bring pressure to the air quality. Finally, the contributions of economic growth built in blue and city expansion built in pink had decreased in some urban, uh, urban agglomerations, especially in Yangtze River Delta, Pearl River Delta, and Beibu Gulf urban agglomeration, which means that economic urbanization and land urbanization were getting less dirty in these urban agglomerations. Within urban agglomerations, we compare the decomposition results between central cities and peripheral cities. This scatter plot shows the contributions of population agglomeration before, before and after 2013. To simplify, we put the two less developed nation, national urban agglomerations, middle reaches of the, Yan, of the Yangtze River and Chengdu Chongqing into a group, and the four regional urban agglomerations into a group. In each small scatter plot, red dots represent central cities and blue dots represent peripheral cities. The x-axis shows the, shows the annual change of population agglomeration of cities, and the y-axis shows its contribution to the annual change of has exposure. From this chart, we can see that before 2013, most central cities are in the right upper quadrant. It means that population agglomeration increased in central cities and blow has exposure. But after 2013, the red dots moved down to x axis and showing that the population agglomeration no longer increased the has exposure and even helped to decrease has exposure. In some, in, in some cities such as Tianjin, uh, Chongqing, Wuhan, Chengdu, which implies that they re realize green population urbanization. While in Yangtze River Delta and middle reaches of Yangtze River and Chengdu, Chongqing and regional urban agglomerations, some blue dots move up to y-axis uh, exist in these cities, population urbanization significantly increased the risk of has exposure. In this page, the upper scatter plot shows the contributions of economic growth, and the lower one shows the contributions of city expansion. Before 2013, most cities are in the upper quadrant showing that economic and land urbanization brought has exposure, uh, bro has pollution in central cities and peripheral cities. While after 2013, the red dots moved down to x axis, uh, showing that the contributions of economic growth and city expansion are nearly zero. In other words, the economic and land urbanization in central cities no longer polluted the sky, but the positive relations between has exposure and economic growth and between has exposure and city expansion still hold in peripheral cities. In these two pl pl plots, uh, showing that economic and land urbanization still broad has pollution in peripheral cities. And this scatter plot shows the contributions of emission intensity it is obvious that after, 20, after 2013, peripheral cities moved down sharply, implying that emission intensity helped a lot to reduce haze exposure. It shows the efficiency of haze pollution abatement in peripheral cities. As for central cities, although their emission intensity declined, its contribution are nearly zero implying that the has pollution control in central cities was getting more difficult. This result shows that after the, the APCAP policy, the has pollution abatement in central cities relieved the pressure of has pollution control of central cities and effectively reduced the regional has pollution. 
Now let me sum up of my presentation. We found that after the after the APCA policy in the urban agglomeration level, emission intensity became the leading factor to reduce the hazard exposure in most urban agglomerations. And population agglomeration helped to reduce hazard exposure in the top two urban agglomerations. And the positive contributes contributions of in economic growth and city expansion had decreased in some urban agglomerations, showing that the policy strengthened the effect of has pollution control and alleviate the adverse effects of urbanization in some urban agglomerations. And within urban agglomerations, population urban agglomeration in some central cities helped to decrease has exposure while population inflow brought some pressure to the air quality in some peripheral cities. As for economic growth and city expansion, their adverse effects were nearly zero in most central cities, but still maintained in some peripheral cities, implying that the economic and land urbanization are getting cleaner in central cities, but still damage to air quality in peripheral cities. The contributions of emission intensity were nearly zero in central cities, but fortunately, emission intensity in peripheral cities helped a lot to reduce hazard exposure. It means that the, uh, the, policy, the policy encouraged the peripheral cities to strengthen hazard pollution control enforcement, which relieved the pressure of central cities to control hazard pollution and promote the the air quality of uh, urban agglomerations it and it emphasized the importance of regional collaboration mechanism. And that's all my presentation. Thank, thanks for your attention. Thank you very much. Again, a very interesting presentation. I. Um, um, I ha had I never heard before of this methodology of uh, logarithmic mean divisia index, so it was interesting for me to to learn about it. Um, are there any questions in uh, uh, within the attendees? First of all, you can raise your hand anytime. Um, so if there are no more, uh, other questions, uh, I'd like to uh, ask you why you chose for this methodology and not, for example, for a classical economic regression, um, linear regression, like what is the advantage of using logarithmic mean division index? Um, this method is, uh, is used to uh, calculate the uh, to to find out the contributions of some factors uh, and it it was and it and it was it used to um decompose the uh, in in the traditional lmdi approach is to use to decompose the change of in uh, energy consumption or intensity or carbon emission intensity uh, into contributions of various social economic factors such as economic structure, energy intense, intensity, uh, and so on, and quantify the contributions of them. But uh, compared to the linear regression, uh, this method can only say it uh, can only can, can only um, find the contributions rather than causal relation. So it is the limit of the decomposition method, but I think is quite different from the linear uh, linear regression because linear regression focus on the causal relation, uh, but um, we can't um, uh, we can eliminate the 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 effects of some some factors and 
only focus on one uh, and we um, because this uh, these five factors are uh, related to each other so we can't use a uh, linear regression to find out the contributions of them um i don't know if i mm, give you a <laughs> yes i get the the main idea thank you thank you very much um then okay so uh, if i understood correctly the main impact of the regulation that was put in place is an increase in emission intensity right and that was what allowed to reduce pollution um so why like do you have some interpretation on what exactly uh how exactly that emission intensity has has been reduced or increased i don't know which sense it should be said um thanks to the regulation what was practically put in place what is it mainly in the industrial sector or in the residential sector mm, i think both of them because um <clears throat> this this policy will encourage residents to uh to go out by uh, public transportation and that's help to reduce the uh, has has pollution emission and in the industrial re region they will force them to use uh, cleaner equipment or te technique and they will force governments to uh, to, to 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 supervise supervision supervise them uh, mm -hmm. So, I think uh, with this policy, uh, all people will um, make a effort of them to reduce haze uh, pollution. Okay. Uh, then maybe I have a last question related to one of your conclusion. I found it quite interesting that you had that regional cooperation between uh within urban agglomerations with uh, zero change in most central cities for emission in sentence in, in emission in, uh, intensity and mostly in peripheral uh, cities uh why do you think is it so is it maybe because there are more heavy industries outside of the cities or like do you have any idea on why you have these results uh you mean why in cent and uh, the has pollution in central cities uh, the the contributions of emissions in central cities are nearly zero but uh but but not in peripheral cities yes indeed um i think it's because um most central cities are rely uh, rely heavily on most but no all uh, rely heavily on the third industry. So um, maybe their GDP not depend on the in, on the GDP. Uh, uh, their has pollution may not depend heavily on the GDP. So I think uh, even they lower their emission intensity uh, as the per unit of GDP uh the has pollution emission um it helped little to reduce the has pollution because i think uh central cities it is around by peripheral cities and in peripheral cities uh, they rely heavily on the second secondary industry so um the main the main source of central and uh, the main source of has pollution in central cities uh is is regional has pollution so i think um the the reduction in of emission intensity in peripheral cities will help a lot reduce uh has pollution in 
central cities. All right, that was clear. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you. Is there any uh, other question? Um, I have a question. So it's a clarifying question because I'm not, um, I'm, I'm also new for this methodology. I'm not so sure about the um, agglomerations. Um, so in your summary, uh, as sh you show in this slide, so you show that the um, effect is sometimes uh, um, like the emission intensity is uh, lower, but I'm curious, um, do you have any magnitude of this effect or is just say, for example, like um, the uh, it's a large effect or small effect, uh, is there any magnitude of that? Is that mm -hmm. my question? Um, in uh, we use this method and we just want to find out the contributions of the factors uh, to the change of head exposure, uh, to the head exposure. So we don't use the effect or, uh, or, or some, some terms about causal, causal relation. We just, we just call it as contribution and we call it, uh, we say this contribution as it, this met this factor help to reduce uh, some like twenty percent of the change of has exposure. Uh, okay, so it seems that you still have magnitude, right? Like twenty. I mean, the number you you have the number. Yes, yes. Right? We, oh, okay, we okay, the... I got it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So, if I understand it correctly, if we take, for example, the most. Um, uh, below left blue point, it means that for around uh, uh, in YRD, for around uh, minus 8% of uh, annual change of emissions intensity, it contributed to almost uh, more than minus 25% of haze exposure. Is that how you interpret this? Yes, yes. Okay. And uh, what do these dots represent is it for each urban agglomeration um uh, no um each dot represent each city okay and in this plot in this plot it represents uh, all the cities in this urban agglomerations and the red dots right. represent the central cities all right all right okay it's clear now thank you thank you Any other question? Um, then I think we can uh, close this session. Thank you very much to the presenters. Uh, thank you to the room chief uh, Francisco also for uh, helping us. Uh, thank you to the attendees, whether they are watching it right now or later on uh, by recording. Um, it was a very interesting session for me. I learned a lot, so thank you. Uh, and I wish you a very nice day. Thank you, thank you very much. You very much. Emma, if I could just add, uh, please uh, remind uh, the speakers to upload the presentations, please. Yeah. And thank you very much for your presentations. Thank you. Thank you for your okay. organization. Okay, thank yeah. you.